there's still a chance to pull ahead. Tonight, the way we're going to do the quiz is if anyone's missing from your group, that's a point off tonight. So, you have seven people in your group, and only five are here. You get five out of seven, unless they let you know why they're not going to be here tonight. Okay, so like, we're good, Dylan. We're good to say, oh, yeah. we're to call it, you know, we're good. We're good. Or, we're good. or something like that. So, that's how we'll do the quiz tonight, okay? Uh, here's the ranking so far. So you just shoot Stephanie. If you're a group leader, just shoot Stephanie uh, your score for the men tonight. If that makes sense. Um, if you're not sure why they're not here, that'd be good to message them and go, you know, hey, we just did a church study on Sunday. What's going on? Right now? <laughs> you know, you just study this all out, right? Amen. I guess you mention it. Amen. 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 Our brothers keepers. So here's the ranking so far. In first place is Daniel's team. Amen. Whoa.
We talk about getting a great deal on a car, amen? amen. But you know, tonight we're going to talk about building a great church. Come on. Come on. I don't know about you guys, I don't want to be part of a lame church, I want to be part of a great church, amen? amen? And the cool thing about the church is Jesus said, I've come to build a church and the gates of hell shall not prevail, amen? Come on. And I believe as men in the church, we got to have the same conviction as Jesus, that we're going to build his church and hell won't prevent it, amen? Yeah. amen? We put something as great because it's special and you can't find it anywhere else, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to delve into Acts chapters 1 through 8, and we're going to see the Holy Spirit building a great church. Now, people have called Acts the Acts of the Apostles, but really a more appropriate name is the Acts of the Holy Spirit, amen? amen. And as we go through this Bible study, I want every brother in here to ask themselves one question. You listening? Yes. If everyone in the church were like me, what kind of church would this be? Mm. If everyone in the church was like me, what kind of church would this be? Let's look at Acts chapter 1 here. We're going to begin in verse 1. The Bible says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, Acts is written by Luke. So you guys know the gospel of Luke. Acts is like part two of Luke and written by the same author, amen? And he says it's written to Theophilus, which is a literary device. Theo, of course, being God in the Greek and Philo being friend. So this letter is written to all of us friends of God. And are you a friend of God tonight, brother? Yes. No. And so this is written to us. Now, look at verse two. It says, until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So Jesus resurrects from the dead. And for 40 days, he appeared. The Bible says in Corinthians 15 that he appeared to 500 of the brothers. Amen. Mm -hmm. He appeared to all these different people. And what was the one topic he preached about? Kingdom. The kingdom of God. That was his singular focus. The church. And that's what Acts is going to chronicle. The church of God on earth. Verse 6. He goes, then they gathered around him and said, asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know, amazingly, the original apostles still thought that it was going to be some type of Davidic type kingdom, right? They thought back to King David who would throw off the rule of the Philistines to have the physical nation of Israel, they thought Jesus was going to throw off the Romans and have a physical kingdom. But Jesus goes, no, this is a spiritual kingdom. That's what we study out in the kingdom of God study, amen? And he says it's going to begin in Jerusalem. It's going to go to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is Luke's version of the Great Commission, amen? That phrase that the Holy Spirit will take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That phrase, the ends of the earth, is used 42 times in the Old Testament, six times in the New Testament, mm -hmm. and two times in the book of Acts. Some have said we're not commanded to evangelize the nations in our generation, amen? Look at this in Acts 13, if you keep your finger there. In Acts 13 and verse 44, Come on, Mike. we find uh, here in this passage, second time this phrase is used in the book of Acts. It says, then Paul and Barnabas, in verse 46, Acts 13, 46, then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, we had to speak the word of God to you first, since you reject it, and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And the church says, And so the only time you can bring salvation to the ends of the earth is in your generation. Amen? And so we are commanded to get to all nations. And Paul's preaching here from the city in Antioch, and he goes, this isn't just a suggestion. This is a command. Amen? We're familiar with Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. Can anyone quote it? Therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and sure them would go always to the very end of the age. Amen? See, our first point, we're going to build a great church. We need to obey the Great Commission. Amen? Amen. Not the great suggestion, not the great idea, but the Great Commission, the command of God. And what does the Matthew 28 say? Here's the plan to change the world. One disciple is all it takes. 
to meet another man and make him into another disciple. And then the Bible says, after you make him into a disciple, you baptize them, amen. amen. And then after baptism, you stay with that new disciple. And the Bible says in Matthew 28, 20, you teach them to obey everything I commanded. Not suggest. Come on. So, what was the last thing Jesus commanded them? Go and make them, Go make them disciples, amen. So we see the Great Commission is not just for the apostles. It's for every single disciple, amen. And this is the way we're going to get to the ends of the earth. I've got to ask you, how's your discipling relationship going, amen? Come on. Are you being taught to obey? Are you being challenged by the word of God? Do you look for discipling to transform and change so that you can be more effective at bringing the gospel and evangelizing Come the world? Come on. And to evangelize the world, guys, it doesn't mean everyone will become a Christian. The Bible says the road's narrow, amen? Come on. It means that every single person gets a chance to hear the gospel of Christ. That's our mission, and that was the motivating vision of the early church, and this is the thesis of the book of Acts in Acts 1a, that it will get to the ends of the earth. Amen. If you're not about the Great Commission, you become a dead end disciple. Mm -hmm. The mission stops with you. You know, if you look on your phone, I sent you the Crown of Thorns project in the WhatsApp group that our movement bases our plan off of this verse in Acts 1a. Amen. You know, our movement really got started in Portland, but it really got its beginning in some ways in Los Angeles. That's where that foundational base was laid. And so, in some ways, we call it Los Angeles the Jerusalem of the movement, if you will. And then to get to Judea and Samaria, of course, is like the regional area around it. For us, that'd be like America, amen? amen. And then, of course, the ends of the earth, well, that's the ends of the earth. And then later on, we introduced a project called Operation Eagle. Again, this is on your WhatsApp group where we are striving to get a church in every state of America. Because America is where we're going to find a lot of the money to be able to support these foreign church plantings. Amen? Yep. And what's kind of cool is that if you think about even our part of the world in New England, a couple of years ago there was only one church in New England in Boston. Now we planted a church last September in Providence, Rhode Island. <laughs> Amen. In June, we're going to have a church in Portland, Maine, and in Manchester, New Hampshire. Come on. Amen. We have a church in Connecticut already. Come on. And what's kind of cool is then that just leaves Vermont left, and we have the most atheistic part of the nation because we have disciples that are focused on the Great Commission. Amen. Come on. Guys, we are changing the world and giving hope to a place where there's rarely any churches, and the churches that are here in New England are dead end ancient churches that are just simply memorials. Oh, man. Come on, Tom. Episcopalian and all this thing. You'll see it when we go to Old South on Sunday for Jordan Christine's wedding. These are just memorials that have families and lineage and old money that are donated to these churches to just survive. But what's going on in here is so special. Come on, we are part of a movement that is forcefully advancing around the world Come because on, we've decided to obey the Great Commission. Come on, man. You know, it's encouraging to see the forceful advancement of God's kingdom, but we've got to ask, if everyone in the church was like me, how evangelistic would this church be? How many visitors would the church have if everyone in the church was like me? Are you willing to do anything it takes to see Jesus' dream done in our generation? Point two is if you're going to obey the Great Commission, you got to have a great message, amen? Yeah. A great church has a great message. Let's look at the message in Acts 2. Peter is preaching now to the, the thousands that have gathered there for Pentecost. And he says in Acts 2, verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, bring him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. You know, he reads some scripture to prove that Jesus was the promised Messiah. And drop down to verse 29. It says, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died, was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place a descendant on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are witnesses of it, amen? amen. So we find that this great message centers around two essential things. One, Jesus died for the sins of all mankind. Amen. And he was credited by God, and we know that because of the miracles that he performed. Two, he resurrected on the third day to prove he was the Messiah. 
And understand, brothers, this separates Christianity from all other world religions. Mm. True. Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, all these religions. Self-help. All these religions teach that you've got to attain and work hard to get to God. Or if you're atheist, just do good things to be a good person in this world. And yet, what makes Christianity unique is that God loved the world so much that he said, instead of these people having to attain to me by their good works, I'm going to come down to them and live as one of them, experience the temptations they face, experience the hardship they face. Our God can relate to us. Can I get an amen? amen. He came down as a man, died for our sins, killing sin's power in his body, and then he resurrected and overcame the grave. You see, you can go to the tomb of Muhammad and his bones are there. Yeah. You can go to the tomb of Confucius and his bones are there. Oh, you can go to the tomb of Darwin and his bones are there. Yeah. But the tomb of Jesus is empty, amen, yeah. brothers? Yeah. Come on. And this was the great message of the early church. Our primary message is not just the vision of the church. It's not just the awesome club that we have on campus or whatever it might be, your roommate, your household. That's not the message of our church. The message of our church is that Jesus was crucified for your sins. Amen. Amen. And this separates Christianity from everything else. How much do they believe the message? How much did they put everything on the line for this message? Well, we know that Peter had denied Jesus just 50 days earlier before a servant girl. Scared. You were one of those disciples because no one not. And yet now 50 days later... He is boldly preaching before thousands. No fear. What transformed? He got broken about his sin. Come on. And he transformed and changed. Brothers, you want to get powerful and bold in your message? Get broken about your sin and what it did to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you'll love Christ so much. You'll go, I'm willing to do whatever it takes for him. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to put my life on the line. Eleven of the original twelve apostles followers of Jesus died a martyr's death. Died brutal deaths you can read about in history. You see, you don't die for a lie. They were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And I'm going to ask you, how deep is your conviction that Jesus is real? Come on, bro. It will show in the message that you preach. And verse 36, he concludes, he goes, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. You know, at the end of this sermon, he reiterates the fact that they crucified Jesus. You know, many Americans believe that Jesus died for them, but their lives are no different than the world's. Why? Because they don't understand that Jesus died for their sins personally. That this isn't just some religious message or some necklace that we wear around. This is our very heart. And when we studied the Bible, you remember how it was going through your sin? And you felt convicted, and you were moved. I remember doing my studies and just crying. Back when I was a teenager, crying the fact that someone loved me enough to die in my place so that I could have a chance to be saved. Mm, and I don't know about you, have you ever seen a boring baptism? Nope. I never have. I mean, anytime someone gets baptized, they come up out of that water and there's a new life and there's an excitement and there's a joy. And there's never a boring testimony. God changes every single individual's life. I thought seeing uh, Shay Song baptized on Sunday was awesome. Yeah. And you heard what he shared. Here's a guy who never read the Bible. No faith in Christ. The brothers study the Bible with him after Veronica brings him to church. And as he reads about John just at the beginning wanting to just learn English, amen, he starts to fall in love with Jesus Christ. Amen. And one of the things we talked about when we counted the cost was just the idea that Jesus Christ dying for us is what motivates us to live the Christian life. Yeah, we need to have a conviction that before the good news of the resurrection can be received, you've got to know the bad news that our sin killed Jesus. Amen? Come on. This is a great message that we preach that changes people. 
You know, if we're going to build a great church, there's going to be great numbers, amen? amen? There's going to be great numbers of people that come to get saved. <coughs> Many think that the church was just an autonomous group of people, but they weren't. They were a movement, amen? In Acts chapter 1, we find that the foundation of the church started with some pretty incredible disciples. Check out this list here. <coughs> Verse 12 says, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk in the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Albus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So this is pretty powerful. After three years of Jesus' ministry in Israel, we find here there are only 120 faithful disciples. We know that in verse 15. It says, in those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. Pretty encouraging. That's about the size of our church after having stood up prominent. Come on. Awesome. Amen. But here you have 120 disciples. Who were these 120? Well, you've got the 11 faithful apostles. They'd be pretty awesome to have on your mission team. Amen. Of course, you've got the women that followed Jesus. And here you have Jesus' family, his mom and his brothers who were disciples. We know most likely the 70, uh, what are some kind of called apostles, or lowercase a apostles, that were sent out in Luke chapter 10, are there with them as well. These people are amazing because they were all willing to die for the cause. And that was the foundation of the church. Then Peter preaches his great message, and we read this in Acts 2, verse 41. <clears throat> Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number. Well, what number were they added to, guys? The 120. They were added to their number that day, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Well, 3,000 are added to the 120, and they're baptized, and the Bible says they're just as devoted as the 120. You see, they had the same commitment as the apostles, the 70, amen? The 70 had the same commitment as the 12 apostles, of course, Matthias being the replacement there. They had the same commitment as Jesus' family. It was indistinguishable. Why? You see, in order to be baptized, you have to be sold out to Christ. Amen? You have to be sold out to Christ. You know, tonight, guys, do we have a sold out church? Come on. Yeah. There's no distinguishing between an apostle and a disciple. Many years ago, there's someone who studied the Bible, and the story goes that, you know, they, they say, well, I just feel like you're saying I have to be as committed as the apostle, uh, the, as the apostle is what he said to the preacher. And the preacher goes, well, no, I'm not saying you need to be as committed as the apostles. I'm saying you need to be as committed as Jesus. Come on. And Jesus is willing to die for what he believed in. Oh, you see, yeah. we are all called not to Mike's standard, not to some leader in the church or region leader, not just to, and there might be things you can imitate and grow in, but, but not to the apostles. We are called to be like Jesus Christ. Come and on. so great numbers came in the church when they had a sold out base. Verse 47. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Amen? Come on. Amen. You see, when we're about praising God and we enjoy each other, God's going to add to our number. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, chapter 4, verse 4. Lord. But many who heard the message believed, and so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Pretty awesome that the men were leading the way. Come on. Come on. Look at chapter 5, verse 14. The Bible says, nevertheless. You know, nevertheless just means no excuses. Amen? Amen. Ooh. More and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Amen? Amen. So far, the church is only in Jerusalem still. And we're going to look in chapter 6, verse 1. It says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing. Amen? So that's how we want it today. Amen? We want the disciples increasing. <laughs> chapter 6, verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Well, the word of God here spreads not only just a little bit, but rapidly. Can you believe there are actually some churches out there that want to grow slowly? They go, I, I like a slow-growing church. And yet, was that the church in the New Testament? No. No, they grew rapidly. In fact, so rapidly that the testimony was so powerful for the early church that priests became obedient to the faith. How would you like to see pastors get baptized? In yeah, bro. And people come to a conviction of the truth. Amen. That's what was happening. The word of God was spreading. It was spreading like a wildfire. Amen. Amen. This was a movement spreading all over Jerusalem at this point. Amen. And in chapter 8, verse 12, remember they're going to go to Jerusalem, Judea, the surrounding Jerusalem. And then what else? What was the next one? 
Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. 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 There we go. All right. So now in chapter 8, look what happens in chapter 8, verse 12. The Bible says, But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So this is now in Samaria that people are getting baptized. And then in chapter 9, verse 31, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed the time of peace and strength was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. And once again, the church is to increase in numbers. If a church isn't growing, it's not part of God's kingdom. Amen? The church grows and increases when it's strengthened by the Holy Spirit, meaning all the members are walking with God. Brothers, do we have good quiet times this morning? Yes. Yes. The Holy Spirit spoke to us and moved us and prompted our hearts and convicted us. Yes. And they walked in the fear of God. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Amen. Amen. Well, let's move on. Let's go to chapter, uh, not, uh, chapter 13, verse 49. And we'll look at the first great mission church, the Antioch church. And it uh, happens, uh, excuse me, in chapter 11. And then here in chapter 13, we've got the verse 39. It says... The word of the Lord spread through that whole region. So now we here we have the concept of a region. You know, in our church, we have the North Shore region. And then, come on. Okay, we have the Northwest region. Come on, come on. Of course, we have the Central region. Yeah. And then we have the South region. Amen. Yeah. And, you know, Daniel is not just in charge of the, you know, 20 people and under his charge or whatever it might be, 20 to 30 people. He is in charge of the thousands and thousands that live and the North Shore. Uh, Raphael and Melissa don't just, you know, oversee the 30 people that are in the South region. They are charged to preach the word of God to all of Dorchester, all of Quincy, all of Randolph, all of Braintree, all of the South region. Are you with me right now? Yeah. And so understand, guys, that now when we break our church up, we are charged to evangelize these different regions. And the word of God here just continues to spread uh, through what are the early mission churches there. You know, chapter 14, verse 1, it says, At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. They spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. Amen? Amen. Now Iconium is getting the word of God, and here we see the concept that the more effective you speak, the more numbers will come into the kingdom. Amen? Amen. And that's what First Principles is all about. Hopefully you guys are learning to become better communicators of the word of God. Cool. And verse 21 says, They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Amen? So again, they were soul winners, and that's what we need to be. And chapter 16, verse 5, I love this here. It says, so the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. Well, now, not just the church in Jerusalem, but all the churches were growing. How often, guys? Daily. Daily. You know, we've had a few, few weeks that we've had daily additions in our church. But, you know, don't you dream of the day that we'll see daily additions mm -hmm. here in Boston? But then the outlying churches as well, when Providence starts seeing daily additions, Portland starts seeing daily additions, and Manchester starts Come seeing on, daily man. additions. Man. Chapter 17, oh. what's it take? See, here's the deal. Everyone wants Bible results, but you've got to put in Bible effort. Are you with me right here? Come on, Mike. And Bible effort is willing to die. You know, chapter 17, drag Jason and some of the other believers before the city and officials shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. Mm. You know, the New Revised Standard Version says, these are the men who have turned the world upside down. Amen? Mm -hmm. And that verse was the rallying call of our movement in the beginning. That's why a lot of the preacher's emails had USD, right? Upside down, turning the world upside down in the 21st century. Oh. Amen? Yes. So they turned the world upside down. Everyone had heard about the church. You know, by the time we get to chapter 28, the book of Acts. Paul's on his way to Rome, and he's going to be in house arrest at the end of his life, but prior, verse 22, it says, but we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. See, at this point, people everywhere had heard about the church, and that's what it means to evangelize the world. You guys know Starbucks evangelize the world. Us in Dubai, you know, we're in old Dubai, and sure enough, there's a Starbucks. When I was in Chennai, India, sure enough, there's a Starbucks. When I was in Santiago, Chile, sure enough, there's a Starbucks. When I was in Mexico City, sure enough, there's a Starbucks. Everyone's heard of it. 
You see, that's what it means to evangelize the world. Not that everyone would be Christian, not that everyone would go through the first principle studies, but that everyone hears about God's church. Oh, no. That's the mission. You know, in Acts 28, verse 22, Paul, after this, is in prison in Rome and house arrest. And this is when he writes the letter to the Colossae church in Colossians. So let's go over there and see what he writes in Colossians. Some 30 years later, after the church started in 29 AD, and it's now 62 AD, amen, brothers? And let's see what God can do in only 30 years. In Colossians 1 and verse 6, look at what Paul writes. He says, in the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole what? World. The whole world, amen? Look at verse 23. He says here, if you continue in your faith, establish and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you have heard, that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Guys, did they evangelize the nations in their generation? Yep. Yep. They did. The entire known world at that time had heard the gospel. And that's what we need to do today. Amen. Do you think we can do this again, church? Yes, sir. Yes. Oh. You see, generation has come and gone after the first century, and no one's evangelized. Because there haven't been the men and the women that had the faith to do so. You know, being in Dubai was so amazing. Of course, seeing the vision there for the Middle East and the different church plantings that we're going to plant even this year that you heard about in the GNN video. But it was kind of neat being with the church in Dubai because you had so many disciples of different nationalities. Mm -hmm. uh, people there from Mexico, people there from Scotland. Remember, all these different nationalities in the church. I go, wow, this is amazing. This is a group that could evangelize the world. And this is why it's so important for us that we build a multi-racial church, amen? Because we need to be able to send out people to all different parts of the world that can relate to the people and bring them in, amen? amen. So, numbers are important to God, and there were great numbers that came in. Some people go, well, I don't, I don't like to talk about numbers. <laughs> And those are the people that don't have numbers. Are you with me right here? Yeah, That's why they don't like talking about numbers. And there's a whole book in the Bible called Numbers, amen? So numbers understand they represent souls. That's why when we moved here in 2020, we only had 50 members of the church. We said, hey, we want 120 in 2020. Come on. God gave us that. And, and, and then 2021 was awesome because what happened is God was able to forge a mission team that we could send to Providence, Rhode Island. And it's awesome. And that's what the church does. It grows and it births more churches. And as you read the book of Acts, you see this wasn't some autonomous collection of churches. It was a movement. And if everyone that worked together to obey Jesus' dream, um, we could do the, the, the incredible. <coughs> I mean, not even the sky's the limit to what we could do as a church. So once again, if everyone is like me, how would the church be? Mm. Well, how did they do this? How did they evangelize the nations in one generation? They had great boldness. Mm, come on, great boldness. Look at Acts chapter 3. Go, Mike. <coughs> Verse 1. Look at this. Says, Since then you've been raised with Christ. Go to Acts chapter 3. Yeah, that's what I'm I like that. It's a good scripture. All right, Acts 3, verse 1, it says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. You know, i got to ask you, do you have your time of prayer? Mm -hmm. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight out at us, did John? Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened then. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished. And came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided not to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one, and asked that a murderer be released to you. 
You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. Do you guys see the boldness in this? I mean, this is an incredible story. This guy has never walked before. And all of a sudden, you know, I love Peter and John because this beggar comes up to them. And a lot of us would be like, hey, leave me alone. Or maybe give him some money and move on. And yet they use this as an opportunity to display the power of God and the power of the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And he says, hey, walk. And imagine for the first time ever, this guy has feeling in his ankles and his legs. And he can walk. And truly gets healed at the gate called beautiful. And truly this is a beautiful miracle of God. Amen. And what happens? Well, he's standing for the first time in his life, and Peter invites him to worship at the temple. And he's not just walking with them, he's jumping up and down praising God. He is so fired up. Is that how you came to church tonight? Yes. Yes. i got to be honest, the energy is a little low today. Mm -hmm. And I think brothers come in, and we let the world impact us, and we forget how much we've been healed of. Amen. We've been healed and forgiven of our sins, and so we need to come to church with energy to show our great God how much he means to us. Yes. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. And this Amen. is the heart of every disciple. But once again, we see that the message is bad news. You crucified Jesus, but the good news was he was resurrected, and you can change. You can be transformed, and you can have access to the power of God. We can't be afraid to preach this message to our friends. And I love what the Bible says here. It says that simply... Verse 11, when the man held on to Peter and John. You know, sometimes you just got to hold on to the guys that are studying the Bible with you. If you're studying the Bible with you, you got to hold on to them after baptism to learn this new life and to walk with the different brothers and the different sisters. Well, let's see what happens to these guys in Acts chapter 4. It says in verse 1, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in the jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Well, this is exciting. They couldn't stop this thing. Even though they tried to put these men in jail, the movement just continues to forcefully advance. And this is the first time we see some persecution in the early church here. Peter and John, the leaders of the church, are thrown in jail. Well, let's look at what happens in verse 5. The next day, the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. And Ananias the high priest was there. And so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the others of the high priest's family. Then Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power and name did you do this? Well, here's Peter, who had the guts to preach to thousands at Pentecost. But now he's before not just the Jews that came to Pentecost, but the Sanhedrin. You guys know who the Sanhedrin is? Mm -hmm. The Sanhedrin was Israel's uh, theocracy, the most elite learned men in all of Israel at this time. And we're not just religious and intellectual, but the government elite of their day. How would you feel being brought before this council? And they tried to intimidate Peter, asking him, by what power did you do this? And we read in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to the rulers and elders of the people, If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame, and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Woo! This is bold. He says, all of you guys are lost unless you believe in Jesus Christ. Amen? He's the way, the truth, and the life. And he had the guts to proclaim the message to the most elite people of all of Israel. You know, in verse 13... It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. What was the defining quality that let these men know they had walked with Jesus? It was their courage. 
See, courage is going to make you more like Christ. And they took note. They'd been discipled by Jesus, amen. They'd been trained by Jesus. You see, these were ordinary men, fishermen, tax collectors that Jesus called to follow him. But they went from ordinary to extraordinary because they walked with Jesus. Come on. And if you want to be an extraordinary disciple, you've got to walk closely to our Lord Jesus. But you've got to be discipled. And you've got to be trained. And you've got to be pushed so that you can learn to be courageous. Amen. Amen. I like in the Greek, you know, ordinary is idiote in the Greek. It's the idea that these unschooled idiots. Because these unschooled idiots were so courageous. It set them apart from all the religious leaders. You know what our church needs right now? Bold men. Men that are willing to take a risk. Share their faith with people that intimidate them. Be courageous when it comes to leading their spouses and their girlfriends. Come on. To disciple them with the word of God and be bold. Come on, it's going to take men that are willing to go out there and lead other men. Men that are willing to confront sin when they see brothers. There are brothers not here tonight. I'm concerned about them. But who are going to be the men that get in their lives and courageously call them back to their commitment? Oh my, oh my. Great boldness. Boldness is what makes us like Christ. You know, verse 14, it says, But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they've performed a notable sign, and we can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people... We must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Well, this was the brightest group in Israel. Because, in fact, they figured out how to stop Christianity. Mm. See, let's see what they did. How did they figure out how to stop Christianity? Well, verse 18, it says, Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Yeah. I mean, they were blown away and told the guy to be healed. Old man, <laughs> old man you know, he'd say you can't teach an old girl to do tricks, but man, isn't it inspiring when even an old guy becomes a Christian? But this is the Sanhedrin, the government of Israel, and coming together, they go, what can we do to stop this thing? And they figured out how to stop it. We won't ask them to stop being Christians. We won't ask them to change their morals. We'll get them to shut up. And if they can stop talking, Christianity stops. You see, there's a violence to silence. And when you stop sharing your faith, you become the dead end of God's movements. Wow. And yet the Holy Spirit wants to fill us to be bold. They go, we'll quarantine them is what we'll do. Mm. You know, the smartest guys in Israel figured out how to stop Christianity is to get them to shut up. But you have the courage and the boldness of Peter and John to go, hey, we need to obey God. We can't help but speak about what we've experienced. See, have you ever felt like you were supposed to share your faith with the person you didn't. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. And you know, you're, 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 you're there in that Uber, or you're there at the grocery <laughs> store, and, and you, you know, it's just on your mind. And you know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit. Come on. Mm -hmm. Because the Holy Spirit wants to share his faith. The Holy <coughs> Spirit wants to evangelize the world. But you've got to keep in step with him. Amen. 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 And you've got to follow that prompting to share your faith. Is there anybody you won't share with? Are you Who are you intimidated by? What race intimidates you? Uh, what type of person intimidates you? Maybe it's their economic stats. Maybe you go, oh, they're rich, or they're in the government. I can't share my faith with them. Who is it that you need to challenge yourselves this week to be bold, to share with? You know, in Acts chapter 4, let's see what happens here in verse 23. Remember, the entire church is only in Jerusalem at this point. But now the Jerusalem church is thousands, probably over 10,000. And it says in verse 23, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you've made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. So they pray to God. And then it's cool, verse 29, it says, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great what? Boldness. Boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal before 
perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Amen. Amen. Well, they go back to share good news with the Christians, and that's why we share good news about what God is doing. And this is all the Christians of the entire world at this point together. Praying. Will that not be powerful? Right. Mm. Wow. And they pray, and they start their prayer off with Sovereign Lord. See, Sovereign Lord means that whatever happens in our lives, good, bad, either God has made happen, or he's allowed to happen. They trusted in a Sovereign God. And they didn't pray, God, it's so tough. The persecution is so hard, and my life is so terrible. Please stop it, God. They didn't get religious. In the name of Jesus, I, I name it and I claim it, it stopped. They go, Sovereign Lord, enable us to be bold. Come on. Come on. So that we can preach God's word. Come on. See, persecution is going to happen. But we've got to pray for boldness, and the place shakes. You know, it's pretty incredible. When the original Crown of Thorns Council, or Crown of Thorns Project, was being presented, some of you guys know this, they were in a staff meeting, and Kip brought out the original one, it's called the Five Year Plan. They presented these cities, and they prayed, yes. and literally right after their prayer, there was an earthquake. Wow. And it was God saying, I am with God's new movement. Are you with me? Wow. And that launched the Crown of Thorns Council. I saw a Crown of Thorns project, excuse me, I saw the original project before any of the uh, cities were green. They were all red, meaning they needed to be planted still. And now look at what God's done. Um, completed phase one, we're in well, well way past the end of phase two. I mean, it's amazing to see what the Lord has done. You see, how's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? Are you praying for more boldness? I appreciate it. Daniel showed me the letter today that he got from his apartment complex. Or as a, or it was an attorney, I guess. And it said, you know, he's getting kicked out for holding religious services and baptisms on the paper. That's awesome. And we were just rejoicing about it. We're fired up. Amen. And you trust the sovereign God that God's going to take care of it. Yeah. It's not going to be a big deal. I appreciate when Christian and his team Bible talk uh, teacher kicked him out from using his room for Bible talk. And I talked to the teacher on, on the phone. And, you know, it's like, well, you don't need to be baptized. And, and, and all the garbage. And at the end of the day, I appreciate Christian's boldness. I kicked off. Yeah. I remember when I was in college, I went to college at a Bible college. I studied biblical studies. I got banned from doing Bible studies at a Bible college. I <laughs> 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 was in the dean's office. I was really worried about my future at the school. In the dean's office, I mean, I can't host Bible studies in my room. You know, are you willing to endure persecution? And are you praying those moments, God, this is so tough, or this is hard, or, oh man. My friend stopped studying the Bible, so I don't want to share my faith with anyone else because I don't want to be hurt. Or do we go, God, enable me with great boldness. Amen, Amen. brothers. You see, if everyone in the church was like you, how bold would the church be? You know, finally, as we start to come into a close, a few more. In Acts 4, and verse 32, it says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace so powerfully was at work in them all, that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph the Levite from Cyprus whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Yeah, we're going to build a great church. We're going to take great power and sacrifice. Amen? Amen? Great power and sacrifice to find the early church. And as you preach God's message, there's going to be great miracles that happen in the church. And the unity was so powerful here in the church in Jerusalem because the Bible says they were one of heart and mind. You know, tonight, do you feel one in heart and one in mind with the disciples? Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to be at different places spiritually. But we all have one heart and one purpose, according to the scriptures, to obey the Great Commission. 
And great power is always accompanied by great sacrifice. You find that all throughout the Old Testament. When a sacrifice was made, God shows up, amen? When a vow is made, God shows up. And here in the early church, there's one brother who's giving so much, the Bible says. He sold a field he owned. And back then, he brought the money. They, I mean, they just trusted their leadership, unlike today, you know, where people, they just brought the money to the leader's feet and go, do what, we trust you what you're going to do with it. Pretty amazing, huh? And that's how they gave their money. And it's pretty crazy because this one brother was so sacrificial that they named him Barnabas, which literally means son of encouragement. Amen. Mm -hmm. Son of encouragement. You know, years ago, in our former fellowship, there was a Mainline Church of Christ article that was put out. And it simply said, where's the church that will raise $1 million simply for missions? Because understand, most churches, they raise money for their building project, they raise money for their staff, but where's the church that's going to raise $1 million for missions? Kip and Elena McKean, who led the original Boston Church of Christ in our former fellowship, said, we'll take that challenge. Come on. And, man, it was crazy in the church. Elena sold her diamond ring, and to this day wears a fake one uh, for missions. Uh, one of the sisters sold her favorite horse. Missions. Some of the brothers were sheriffs, you know, selling their uh, coin collection. And it was amazing. They blew it out. They blew out their goal of over a million dollars for missions. That's pretty awesome. Oh, and this is in the 70s, guys, when a million dollars was a lot more than it is even, uh, uh, today, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is pretty, pretty powerful to think about. Well, you know, I want to challenge you. What have you sacrificed for God? We have our special missions coming up. And the disciples saw the great power, and there was great sacrifice. So if everyone in the church was like me, what type of special missions contribution would we have? Come on. If there were one of the 20 me's in the church, what would the missions contribution look like? You know, it's uh, incredible to see the brothers that have sacrificed. We talked about Tyrone, who's in New Hampshire, you know, uh, selling his PS5. Come on. Yeah. I want to challenge, who's the brother that's going to go, Who's the brother that's going to step up and go, I'm going to sell something so precious to you? Great sacrifice. Come on. If everyone in the church was like me, what kind of church would this be? You know, to have a great church, there's going to be great fear. It's going to be great fear. Look at Acts 5, verse 1. Come on, right? <laughs> now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. Uh -oh. so you go, wow, they're so spiritual, right? Well, let's read on. Verse 2. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what happened. Then some young man came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? See, Peter even gave her a chance to repent. Amen. She goes, yes, she said, that's the price. Well, Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. Amen. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's Colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Verse 13 has confused some people because verse 14 then says more people have joined them. But the idea of the language in verse 13 is that all the phonies and the frauds that weren't really serious about being sacrificial, being real Christians, didn't join them anymore. Now, the church grew even more with the real brothers and sisters that were ready to be true disciples. Because a great fear seized the whole church. A lot of people said, oh, this couple was struck down because they didn't give enough money. That's not the point. They were struck down because they hid their sin. 
And they didn't confess it, and they weren't real. And they had the appearance of being sacrificial. And, you know, from one perspective, you go, oh my gosh, they sold a piece of property. This is a pretty wealthy company. Yeah. And, but it's not about the money with God. No. It's about your heart with the Lord. And so they put the appearance of being sacrificial, but they truly weren't being sacrificial. You know, if you look in uh, Revelation chapter 2, we need to understand that we need a great fear of God in the church. As you turn to Revelation 2, Exodus 20.20 20 says, The fear of God will keep you from sinning. That's a good verse to memorize. Mm -hmm. Exodus 20.20. 20. The fear of God will keep you from sinning. We need to remember that God is all-powerful. We need to remember there's a heaven and there's a hell. Are you with me right here? Mm -hmm. And we need to remember that God takes our sin very seriously. And he writes to the church in Thyatira here in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20. He says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. Of course, this is using symbolism, if you will, from the Old Testament. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. This church had greatly lost its fear of God. And the Bible says that they tolerated sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. And he confronts the church not on sin, because we're all going to have sin. Amen, guys? Mm -hmm. And it's not the issue that there was even sexual morality, but the issue was that they were tolerating it. They were allowing it to happen, and they were not dealing with their sins. You know, we need to deal with sin seriously. When you've been involved in pornography, masturbation, sexual immorality, these sins hurt God. And God will bring his discipline on your life. Mm -hmm. And you've got a hidden sin you've not talked to anybody about tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, tonight's the night to allow the Holy Spirit to move you and go, I've got to stop tolerating sin in my life. Amen. And we have a huge opportunity coming up to help you with your purity. You know, on Sunday night at 9 p.m., we are starting a purity group on Zoom. Amen? Mm -hmm. And this is a safe place you can come, and you can be real, you can be open, and we're going to go through a book one of the disciples wrote called A Battle That Even Kings Lost that will really help us as brothers to hold us accountable when it comes to our sexual purity. Amen? Amen. But understand, this is what we need in our lives. We've got to deal with our sin, brothers. I struggle with my purity, but I've got to get open with it. I've got to put it in the light. Amen? Amen. I want to encourage you. Is there anything you're not talking about? Any woman you're talking to that you've not been open about, that you're having sexual conversations with, impure conversations with, Maybe it's just flirting. Maybe it's an impurity of the hearts. Maybe it's with another disciple. Maybe it's with a fall away. Are you dealing radically when it comes to sin? Oh my! You see, when we don't deal with sin, it's because we don't fear God. We do stuff we would never do in front of your own mom or dad. You want to sit there and like, oh yeah, mom, I'm just looking at porn. Right. Masturbating. Like, that's gross to think about. Right. No, you go, well, I'm going to do it before God Almighty. Before the cross, mm -hmm. Come on. Come on, we must real. be our brother's keeper in the fellowship, and not just talk the game and talk the talk, but walk the walk. Mm -hmm. When we confess our sins, don't we feel so much better? Yes. And, and you know how you carry that shame with you, and you feel weird at church, and you kind of really wonder do people know, and, and you know you. you but then when you get open with it, don't you just feel the experience of God's grace? Mm -hmm. And now God can use you as a vessel once again. And so, no matter how bad it's been, I encourage you, God always allows you to turn. And he'll never turn away a broken, repentant sinner. Amen. But sometimes we allow a fear of man to dictate our confession rather than a fear of God. So here's the challenge. We need to challenge sin. We don't want to sometimes because we think, if I really challenge that brother, he might leave the church. No, he leaves the church because you don't challenge him. And he falls away in his heart because you don't get in there. You need to be open to getting help. To be the best disciple you can be. So if everyone in the church was like me, how would the purity of the church be? You know, seven, we need to have great leadership in the church, amen? And I believe men's are leaders. You know, the apostles are put in prison in Acts chapter 5 again. Uh, an angel of God frees them, uh, and then they're put back in prison. And they're brought before the Sanhedrin, and they're kind of, once again, trying to decide what to do. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 38. My mic. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. In Acts 5 and verse 38. 
Gamaliel stands up, who's a Pharisee, and says, Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Amen. Well, man, the apostles, this was great leadership, was it not? And they just go, you know something? We're going to be either fighting God or not. And so Gamaliel has wise advice. Let these people go. And if it's of human origin, it will fade away, fade away and come to nothing. But if it's of God, you won't be able to stop this. God, brothers, do you believe God's with you? Come on. God is with you. I love the reading plan, amen? And yeah. reading about Joshua and Moses and all the great guys. And, and you guys have been reading the reading plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. <laughs> and and, and amen. I appreciate my honest brother. Um, and I encourage you, you know, if you're too far behind, just jump back at, you know, where we're all at. You know what I mean? And it's okay. You can, you can skip that far, right? But what's amazing about it is that God is constantly reminding his people, I'm with you. Joshua, I'm with you. You see, brothers, you've got to understand you are God's man at your job. Come on, bro. At your high school. At your campus. You are the one God has handpicked and chosen to be his servant. You know, this is cool because... The Bible says in Acts 6, 1, the result of this, in verse, chapter 5, verse 42, of course, they preach, how often? Daily. 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 Amen. Daily proclamation, the result in chapter 6, yeah. verse 1, is the number of disciples is increasing. Yeah. Now, let's look at what happens in chapter 6, verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So, we've seen some problems in the early church, haven't we? Yep. Ananias and Sapphira got struck down because they hid their sin. And we learned we can't tolerate sin. You've got to confess your sin if you have hidden sin. Amen? Amen? But now we find another problem. The church is growing, and there's a group being overlooked. Can you believe that? So we learned something very powerful here. Is the church a perfect place? No. 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 It's imperfect. You say, why is it imperfect? Because you and I are both there. Amen? Amen? And we have sin. And so it's imperfect. And this group of widows was being overlooked as the church was growing, and they're not being fed. You know, in verse 2, it says, we find great leadership. What's great leadership do? It says in verse 2, so the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to wait and neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them, and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. You see, the apostles understood that the church leadership needs to be focused on two things. Prayer and the ministry of the word. That's what I call all the region leaders. And the evangelists and women's ministry leaders and the shepherds to be focused on. Our role is to be focused on prayer and advancing the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. And so they get solution-oriented and they go, hey, you know, delegate some of these service things to others who have gifts of servitude. I don't know about you guys, but aren't you grateful that Christian shows up early to help set things up? Come on. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't you grateful that Adrian is up there ushering at church on Sunday? Come on, Adrian. Yeah. I mean, these are, every part and every role is so important. But could you imagine if, 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 if like, I had to do all that stuff? Woo! That'd be really challenging to, like, get ready for my sermon. Sure, bro. And yet I appreciate that there's brothers who are willing to step into these roles. Mm -hmm. Second, we find that racism even hit the early church. And here you have the Hebraic Jews, and the Hebraic Jews were the ones that were more conservative, and they were like, you got to you know, practice the law to the T, and they lived kind of by the temple, near the temple. The, Hebra the Hellenistic Jews, or the Greek Jews, were like the more liberal ones. Are you with me right here? And the Bible says here that they're complaining against the Hebraic Jews because their widows are being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. See, prejudice can hit even the church. And this is why our campaign to build a diverse church is so crucial right now. Because Amen. we need to be able to reach out to people that are different than us so that we don't have these same challenges in our church. Amen. Amen. Now, what's interesting is that it's kind of cool. Um, what happens is if you look in verse 5, they choose these men. It says, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. 
also Philip, and it goes on and lists all these guys. All these guys have Greek names. And so it's interesting, who are the ones doing the complaining? The Greeks. The Greeks. And so he goes, all right, you guys need to be the solution. Come on. Oftentimes we can complain about things in the church, right? And there are real problems. There are valid things to complain about sometimes. If I ask, do you complain, or do you become part of the solution? Right. And this is what the leadership does. Great leadership calls people to be solution-oriented so we can meet the needs in the congregation. Uh, what happened after they implemented this? Verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples of Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Amen? Bless you. You know, this is where in the Greek, um, the idea of waiting on tables and all this, this is where we get the word deacon from. So you've heard of a church deacon. Uh, deacons used in Timothy and different places, and there's qualifications to be a deacon in the church. And so one of the things we're excited to announce is we are going to form a group of deacons and testing, of people that are going to be appointed official deacons in the church for roles of service. And our hope is that people like Adrian and Whitney could be appointed a deacon. Come on! Come on, yeah. Come on deacon! We're already doing the role. Uh, that Anthony and Gabby can be appointed, you know, deacons of mercy. Come on. Come on. Um, of course, then you can have deacons of kids' kingdom. We're going to be talking about replacing Rafael and Melissa here soon for kids' <laughs> kingdom. We have deacons of setup in the morning. And these become people that really master their servitude in the church. On, but there are qualifications to be deacons. You've got to be spiritual, amen? amen. You said here you've got to be full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And then out of that deacon group, our hope is that more shepherds will come out of that deacon. Come on, And oftentimes these guys become shepherds and evangelists, amen? I mean, I'm grateful for Kevin and Jana. They did the administration, amen, amen, for the church. And that's a very much a deacon task, but they eventually became shepherds in God's kingdom, amen? And of course they help us out so much. Uh, with the church. Uh, Raphael and Melissa, of course, do Kids Kingdom, but they're also evangelists and women's ministry leaders. But we need people that are going to volunteer and go, you know something? Uh, I, I want to be in charge of the lost and found at church. Yes. I want to be in charge of the book table at church. I want to be in charge of the guy that makes the new Christian packets and gives it to all the new disciples. Come on. So that everyone has a 40 days of discipleship. Come on. What's a need that you see in the church that you can step up and fill that maybe no one else is doing? Are you with me right here? Yeah. And you can say, man, you know what? I, I, I want to be a deacon. I want to be a shepherd. I want to be an evangelist. Well, you got to do the work first. Amen? Amen. And one of the guys is Stephen, who's listed here. Stephen quickly becomes not just a waiter on tables, but also an evangelist for God's word. And in Acts chapter 7, man, we see some great leadership. Stephen preaches, and he's arrested. And, you know, for, for, for leadership, we've got to be willing to sacrifice, don't we? Here he sacrifices to the point of being arrested, and we'll see eventually Stephen will be the first Christian martyr. But we need great leadership in the church if this is going to be a great church. Young disciples often uh, feel like, well, I don't know what I'm doing yet, so I can't really lead. Or I'm not really called to be a leader. But was Jesus a leader? Yes. Yep. And who are we all called to be like? Jesus. So that means every disciple is called to be a leader. Sure, you might not have an official role. Maybe you're not called to be an evangelist or a woman's ministry leader. But every disciple is called to be a leader. Then you have to go to those around you, and you have to call them to do the same. Uh, we have a leaders meeting on Sunday at 2.30 p.m. every Sunday. I want to encourage every brother to come. Come on. It's going to just challenge you to grow in your leadership. Yes, sir. It's going to inspire you to learn techniques that you can help lead your friends to Christ. I love, and I would, you know, and what's awesome about our church is this is a church that believes in leadership. You know, literally like 60, 70 percent of our church comes to leaders meetings. Is that pretty awesome? Come but on. I want to encourage if you haven't become to leadership meetings, sacrifice the time. It's not a meeting in the body. You don't have to. Only the Bible talk leaders are required to. But I want to challenge you to have that heart. Amen. If Amen. everyone in the church was like me, what kind of leadership would the church have? You know, obviously, with great leadership comes great persecution. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this one like we normally do because we just did our persecution study as a church. Amen. But of course, Stephen stands before the Sanhedrin, and he gives a scathing sermon. Mm. Like, this is like the sermon of sermons, and I would encourage you to read it on your own time. He goes through the history of God's people, and you want to see the response to the sermon, look at chapter 7, and verse 51. And let's see how they handled this. This was a nice little Sunday sermon series that they had going on. 
And verse 51. It says, you stiff-necked people. <laughs> this is, this is in preaching. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Stephen confronts the Sanhedrin on their unspirituality. And listen, when we preach at church, you cannot be uncomfortable with the message that we preach. One of the campaigns we want to start later this year is unfiltered preaching. Amen. Come on, man. It's going to be a mark of our church. And one of the things that we need to be convicted of is like, man, we need to bring our friends and understand it's the preaching of God's word that changes people. Amen. Come on. And I love what Stephen does. Stephen's not looking to the people, or else that would create fear and compromise. Stephen's looking up to God, oh, and he's looking up to heaven, and he understands the ancient charge in 2 Timothy 4, 1, you know, preach the word and the presence of God in Christ Jesus in his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Come on, that's what he's doing. All references have Jesus always sitting at the right hand of God. But as Stephen, in the last few moments of his life, is sacrificing his life for God, here we see Jesus is in honor of the first Christian to die for the faith. Come on. Awesome. See how sold out was Stephen? Well, he was just as sold out as the 3,000 that were baptized on that day in the church. Well, how sold out were those 3,000? Well, they were just as sold out as the 120 that were in the upper room praying for the Spirit to come. Well, how sold out were the 120? Well, they were just as sold out as the 70 that Jesus commissioned out in Luke 10. Well, how sold out were those 70? They were just as sold out as the twelve that Jesus chose, with the exception of one. You see, how sold out were these eleven faithful? They were willing to be like Jesus, to die for their mission and what they believed in. Amen. You see, we've got to understand there's going to be great persecution. You can go online and find all kinds of wicked persecution about our church and our young movement. And I studied the Bible with a guy, and he just kind of bailed out of nowhere. And me and Rafi know what happened. They literally counted the cost with him, or did the church study, excuse me. And he was going to come to Devo, and literally I finished it at like 6, you know, 30 or something like that, and Devo starts coming. And me and Raph just don't know how he texts like Diane and I, and, and Raph, Raph, you know, uh, <coughs> Raph, make it. Never heard from him. I like randomly, I, I, you know, sometimes I like to see what people are saying about our church and stuff, just kind of keep up. And I find this persecution YouTube video, just talking about the International Christian Church, some cult, and blah, 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 and they do this, and all just filled with lies and, and satanic things. And I see a comment by him, because Rob had told me he left his jacket at his house. And he goes, guys, I left my jacket at my mentor's house, I'm not sure what to do. Oh my, you're a grown man and you're scared to go to Raphael's place because of your jacket? <laughs> I'm scared of the cult. <laughs> I go, praise God! He wasn't willing to die for the cause. And stuff. Wow. That's crazy. That's Come on. And gave Come it to on. Some, you want a guy joining the church that, that believes some YouTube video? Yeah. Well, what else are you going to believe? Some meme? <laughs> that's frightening to me. But we need to understand the generation we live in is very weak. And we need to disciple even the Christians in the church to be men. And to have a character about them. That's not easily offended. Easily stifled. You see, 
the early church, Stephen goes, give me stones. And I imagine the first stone just gets up. And the next stone just gets up. And the next stone just gets up. And he's just like Jesus. some it's unimaginable that someone would be killed for their faith. And it's unimaginable because that's how far modern day Christianity has fallen. I dream of a church in this city that defines Christianity. Mm -hmm. I think about it every day. It's my passion. Amen. I, I hope you wake up with a dream of defining Christianity in this city. Yeah. Some of you are going to be asked to go different places. We need you to go. We need you to follow the Holy Spirit. It's uncomfortable to move to another city and be in a smaller church. But we need soldiers who are willing to go. And right now we're having a challenge sometimes just finding people that want to go and just say, yes, here am I, send me, Lord. Come on. No, my home, my comfort, my God. Are you willing to die for Jesus? Come on. You guys, we close out in chapter 8, verse 5. We have Philip here, who's the second guy that was in those list of deacons there. It says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria. So now the gospel's in Samaria, amen? Yeah. And proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks and pure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed in Philip and he proclaimed the, kingdom, the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. See, Philip was one of those seven from Acts 6 that went down to Samaria. So remember the progress. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Amen? Amen? And the Bible says that the city was filled with great joy. And that's our last point. Great joy. Amen? Amen. Verse 12 says, men and women were baptized. Notice, no babies. Amen? Amen. And Simon the sorcerer himself was baptized. This is how powerful the church was that people have never seen anything like this, that opinion leaders, leaders in the world, like Simon the sorcerer, that people followed, were getting baptized from our house. That's what we need in our church. And that comes with great boldness. People that are opinion leaders in the world. The people that are on the football teams on our campus. The people that are on the student councils on our campuses and in our high schools. The people that naturally are leaders. These come are the on. men and women that come into the kingdom of God and they can do great things for God. Come on. So, we got to be a church that has great joy. And isn't that a joy to be a part of God's kingdom? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, can you believe what God has done, guys, for us? Yeah. We're baptizing every week. We've had weekly baptisms. We don't have weekly baptisms this year. We, for the first time, are birthing two new churches, and the only church in the movement that, in the span of a couple months, from September to June, will have birthed three churches. It's incredible to think about. Do you have great joy? You see, joy comes from seeing the miracles of God. And it's all about your perception, whether you see things through the flesh or through the spirit, yeah. Come on, my about the different ways that God is working. Mm -hmm. And so if everyone in the church was like me, what kind of church would this be? Thank you, and God bless. Amen. Come on. Woo!